Okay. Should be good to go now. So first of all, we'll start off if anybody's got any questions from last week. Uh, we've covered basically the background of the honeybees. We talked about all the equipment you're going to be using. And then last week, we kind of talked about how to obtain your bees, how to get them into the hive, and how to get started. So this week, we're going to cover everything you're going to do in one year of beekeeping from this time of the year right now all the way through fall and getting ready for winter for next year. So um, with that, if anybody has any questions, just type them into the chat. Uh, Rose is at home. She's watching the chat line, too, so she'll be able to answer questions on there. Um, she can interrupt me and we can answer them from there too. So feel free to write on the chat line anything you see that you have questions on or just raise your hand and we'll get to you. So we put together a few honeybee facts that uh, are kind of interesting. Uh, we talked about how they've been around for millions of years, but there was actually honey found in King Tut's tomb and it was still edible when they found it. So it's the only food known to man that never goes bad. It may crystallize, but it, it never goes bad. It'll be good forever, provided that the moisture content in it was good when it was put up. Um, it's also the only food that includes all the substances that's necessary to stain life. Now, if you lived off water alone, you would definitely eventually perish from not having enough uh, nutrients. But with honey, it has the liquid and it has the nutrients that you need to survive, which is the only food that is known to have all that. They've got 170 odorant receptors. Um, that's why they're so good at finding the, the flowers that they need to make the, the, the honey. If you compare that to fruit flies, they have 62, mosquitoes have 79. So they're very good at going out and finding what they need to have. Their wings beat at 200 beats per second. They can fly up to six miles and as fast as 15 miles per hour. So when you put those two things together, on this next slide, you're gonna see how far they can travel and how efficient they can be. Um, the average worker bee produces only a one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in her whole lifetime. So you can see how important it is that the honey bees um, work together to get to produce what they can produce. If you stop and think about a hive can produce, you know, 60 to 100 pounds of honey that we get to take off ourselves, not to, mount, not to mention what they can produce themselves. Um, it takes a lot of bees to get that. If only one of them is producing a twelfth of a teaspoon. Some other facts, they can fly 90,000 miles. That would be three times around the world is what they're going to fly to collect one kilogram of honey. It takes one ounce of honey to fuel a bee's flight around the world. So they're pretty efficient. I wish our gas mileage was that good. A honeybee visits 50 to 100 flowers during one collection of a in one trip. So this one I put together to show you guys, I've always joked about, they're the only livestock that you can keep that you don't have to worry about providing food for them yourself because your neighbors will provide just as much, if not more. In one mile radius, if you drew a circle from around your hive, one mile from any distance of that would cover 2,000 acres. Um, if you jump up to five miles, that's 50,000 acres from a five mile straight radius all the way around your hive. So if they're gonna fly on average, you know, up to three miles, you've got a lot of ground out there that is gonna have the flowers and the water. Cause I get a lot of people tell me, well, I, I can't have bees cause I don't have flowers and I don't have an acreage and um, there's, I don't have enough food for them out there. Well, you don't have to worry about that. They're gonna find it themselves. So if there's no questions, we're going to move on to chapter five. And basically, like I said, this is going to cover everything you're going to need to do for one year of beekeeping. So right now, pretty much this is what most of the hives look like. Um, you see these spots out front of the hive. That's normal. There's going to be some bees that perish. Uh, they only live an average of 30 days. They're probably going to live a little bit longer, maybe 60 days in the wintertime when they're not out flying around all summer. In the summertime, they're getting beat up and stuff when they're flying and going out to get flowers. So the wintertime, they're going to stay in the hive. They're going to last a little bit longer. But these are bees that have flown out that was probably at the end of their life cycle. It was too cold for them. Or if you look right here, these bees, they're at the entrance are probably died and the other worker bees are hauling them out to get rid of them. So I kind of peeked at mine today, make sure that the entrance was open. 
make sure the snow wasn't built up on them. And I seen some bees like this dead out in the snow and it's nothing to be concerned about. So once things warm up, it's gonna be time to do your inspections, to get everything cleaned up from the winter, do your high body rotation, see how your brood's equalizing, if, you, if your queen's producing good for you. So we're gonna spend a lot of time tonight talking about what you need to be looking for every time you open up your hives, um, the inspections you're gonna do, and the important things you're gonna do out throughout the year. So we'll start in springtime. Um, when you do your hive rotation, we're talking about those bottom two deeps. The first thing you're gonna do is rotate those because right now all the bees have moved up in the hive and they're gonna be at the top of that second box, that second deep. So once spring comes around, you're gonna to have to look and see what you have left for reserves for honey. You're gonna to wanna to rotate those boxes. Um, it's good to look at the comb to see how dark it is. Remember the darker the comb, the older it is. That comb is kind of a waxy material that's gonna absorb any toxins or anything out there that they bring back. So over time, that spongy comb is gonna absorb those toxins that need to be replaced. It's good to scrape them off and start over, but you don't want to do it all at once. So, you know, do two or three frames in each hive body each year. That's why we recommend writing the dates on the, on the frames so that you know when that's been rotated. This will dramatically reduce your buildup of disease, your, your chemicals, any spores, anything that could be harmful to your bees. So a lot of bees are going to, if you're going to lose bees, a lot of time it's going to be anywhere that mid-March to early April, even late February, because they've used up a lot of their honey reserves and there's nothing out there that's blooming. Um, there's nothing out there to really get pollen and nectar to bring back to. So the, that is a time of year to be really critical. And when it warms up, everybody should be checking their hives to see what the honey reserves are in those hives. That is probably, to me, one of the number one times that you would need to feed your bees, especially on established hives. Uh, you may not have to feed them in the fall or the winter because they've got enough buildup, but that springtime, when the temperatures are warmed up, they're wanting to fly, but there's nothing out there for them to really get, is when you should be thinking about your feeding. So if they start getting low on, on honey or nectar, they're gonna be more aggressive. Uh, they're gonna be reduction of foraging, reduction in hygienic behavior, meaning they're not gonna groom themselves as much and clean themselves as well. Um, there'll be less brood rearing. They're gonna start attacking each other. There's gonna be increase in stress and that's gonna cause them to be more susceptible to the diseases and pets. So lack of pollen is gonna be reduction in drone rearing. You're gonna have a decline in your brood rearing and colony size. They're again gonna increase stress and cause them to be more susceptible to diseases and pests. No different than humans, the greater the stress level is, the better the chances they're gonna get sick. So nectar flow. This is something I, each year my class kind of changes a little bit. I add stuff that maybe I didn't think I had in the past. This is some of the slides we added last year. Um, later on, you're gonna, we're gonna see some slides that I've added today that we didn't have last year, but we got to talking and a lot of people don't understand the difference between nectar and pollen. So, and what are the sources of nectar? So I kind of made a quick little cheat sheet here on that. Nectar is a sugar rich liquid produced by plants and glands called nectaries, either within the flowers with which it attracts pollinating animals. So that's gonna come from the plant itself, the nectar is. It's going to be, in, especially in the spring production, when you have more blooms going on, uh, the brood production is stimulated by this presence of fresh pollen. So it's mother's way, mother nature's way of telling the bees, hey, the food's ready. You can start making more bees because we got more food out here to take care of them. So what can you do to increase the plants and the nectar and everything out there? What I've done is put several slides together here coming up that's gonna show you all the different flowers that bees kind of like and what they prefer. Now, don't try to write all these down because I'm gonna go through them really fast. Um, there's about 20 pictures here, of different, different plants. We've probably got over 120 slides to go through tonight. So, but I, what I want you to do is as I flip through those slides coming up, 
look at the general characteristics that are similar in all these flowers. You're gonna see a pattern there and that's what I want you to notice. But, so we talked about nectar. The next thing is the pollen and the sources of pollen. So the pollen is a fine to coarse powdery substance comprising pollen grains, which are male microgametophytes of seed plants, which produce male gametes or sperm cells. So that's gonna be this yellow powdery stuff you see on the hairs of the bees when they come flying back and forth. So we talked about the flowers that attract honeybees, bee balm, milkweed, Liatris, which is one of my favorite flowers in the wildflowers, coneflowers, goldenrod, honeysuckle, sunflowers, cosmos. And what I want you to start noticing here is these are big, wide, open flowers that the bees can easily fly, land on, get what they need, and take off. They're not really, they don't have to go down into a tube or a trap. There's different colors, but there's just this big, wide open plant for them to land on. Even strawberries have flowers. A lot of vegetable plants do. The dahlias, butterfly bush, marigolds, spring crocus, geraniums. They've all got this big, wide open area for them to land. Squash, magnolia, snapdragon, roses, St. John's wort, phlox, poppies, lavender, hyacinths, catnip, salvia. I plant a lot of this in my yard to, or my flower gardens. The honeybees really seem to enjoy this and it blooms most of the summer is one of the reasons I like it. Blueberries and the dandelions. Now you're gonna hear a lot of people talk about dandelions because as soon as I see dandelions blooming in the springtime, that is when I know I need to get in gear and start paying attention to the bees because once the dandelions bloom, that is the signal that food sources are available for the honeybees and we can start trying to build our hives up, start doing splits because we're no longer gonna have to feed them because we know if the dandelions are blooming, there's plenty of food out there. So the dandelions are gonna stimulate us as well as the bees to get our gear butts in gear and start uh, taking care of the bees, doing the box rotations, putting supers on because we know that the bloom is about to get started and honey production is gonna go up real quick. So now we've got the honey, the dandelions blooming. We know we have to start doing our spring jobs. If we don't see flowers blooming, that time we were talking about, you know, the March and April period, then you need to start doing some feeding. Uh, remember 50 degrees is kind of your key degree to keep track of. If it starts getting above that in the daytime, then it's okay to feed the sugar water. If not, you need to do the sugar patties or the pollen patties it's over here. Um, what I like to do is I like to open station feed, put the sugar water out in the daytime. So when they leave that hive, you know, they generally don't leave until it's about 50 degrees. And then it's safe for them to drink the liquid. I don't put the liquid at the hive because I don't want them drinking it at night when it's gonna get cold and make them sick. Um, that's where the patties come in, especially in the winter time. So another thing you wanna do is avoid swarming. If you get your hives built up, um, once that honey flow gets going, your, the queen gets to lay in a bunch of eggs. Um, one thing about honeybees is you always want to try to stay a step ahead of them. If they get crowded, they're going to get swarming on their mind. Once they get swarming on their mind, it's hard to change their mindset to make them think that they have enough room to stay. So trying to stay ahead of them is key, making sure you keep adding supers and give them plenty of room or, or doing splits. So if you start seeing these right here, these swarm cells are usually at the bottom of the frames. That means they've got it decided in their mind, chances are they're wanting to split and part of the population of the bees are gonna go with them. So a lot of people panic when they see swarming, they think they're losing their bees. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a natural process for the colony reproduction. Um, it's related to overcrowding, especially in the spring, it can be weather, it can be a factor. But as beekeepers, we need to manage the colonies, do everything we can, give them plenty of space to reduce this instinctive urge that the bees have. So there's an old saying 
that a swarm of bees in May is worth a ton of hay. A swarm of bees in June is worth a silver spoon. A swarm of bees in July ain't even worth a fly. The reason they say that is if you can catch a swarm in May or June, they still have plenty of the season left to collect the honey they're gonna need to survive the winter. If you catch a swarm in July or even August, and I have done that, you are gonna have to supplement that feed or you're gonna have to give them some extra honey that you plan on harvesting yourself in order for that colony to be able to make it through the winter. It can be done, but it's gonna take a lot of the stuff that you thought you were gonna be able to keep and sell to give back to that colony. And that's where you have to decide if you wanna do that or not. Um, but that's, that's another advantage that I've talked about myself. I put supers on that are deeps. So for instance, if this situation happens in July or early August, that I have a swarm that I catch, I can take that deep off and now use it as a deep bottom box, put those colony of bees in it, that, I, that swarm of bees I just caught. And now they've already got one box of honey full and maybe I can rob one off another box. Now I have two deeps full of honey for them to go through winter. And that still gives them a little bit of time in September when the goldenrod will start blooming to kind of top it off. But there again, I've got to sacrifice my, my two deeps that I planned on harvesting. Now, if I don't catch that swarm and don't see anything, I can take those two deeps and go ahead and harvest them just like I planned otherwise. So by having those deeps and having those sizes the same, it gives me a little bit of flexibility. So, like I said, a lot of people panic when they see, especially their own bees swarming, they think they're losing them. So there's some things we need to understand about swarming, why the bees do that, is it good or bad? Um, it kind of a little bit, a little bit of both really. But first of all, swarms are not aggressive. The reason they do that is when the bees decide they're gonna swarm, it can be for several different reasons. Maybe the hive is too small, they don't have enough space. Maybe the queen is failing and they want to produce a new queen. Whatever reason, when they decide to swarm, the old queen, the, the original queen, will always be the queen that leaves the hive. She will take off and she will take several bees with her. Probably more than half of your colony is going to go with that original queen. They usually will land about 100 yards or so from that original colony. And they're going to cluster and they're going to cluster like this, which we call swarm. And typically what happens is they will stay on that branch or wherever they land. Um, they may stay there for an hour. They may stay there for a day or so. Typically within 24 hours, they're going to be gone. And what they're doing there is at this point, the queen is in that cluster somewhere. And they're sending out scout bees to look at all the different options they have to go to their new home. And the scouts will come back and report what they find. And then they basically make a democratic decision of deciding which place they want to go to. They have to convince the other bees that their place is better than what their buddy found. Once the bees make that decision, they take off and they go to that place. So this is usually the period that we find these swarms and can catch them. So if somebody calls you and say, hey, I've got a swarm in my tree, you want to get there pretty quick because it may be there for an hour, it may be there for six hours, but within 24 hours or so, they're usually typically gone. So now we understand what they're doing. We can kind of understand where to find them and what to look for and uh, how to handle them. So the good thing about it is if these are your bees that have swarmed, that means you have a new queen in your hive. The other good thing is, since there is a break in the brood cycle, it's gonna take that new queen about two or three weeks from the time she hatches to the time she gets bred to the time she starts laying eggs. So that break in the brood cycle is also gonna be a time that breaks up the mite cycle. So you just had a natural way of controlling your mites by having a break in the brood. So it's the bad part is you're gonna lose out a little bit on honey production for those two or three week period and even longer because your colony numbers are down. 
But the good thing is you had a natural mite reduction. You've got a new queen out of the deal. Um, so there's, there's good and bads to swarming. Usually typically happens in late spring, that late uh, May, June, that's typically when you're gonna see swarming. Um, I've seen it probably as early as uh, mid-April and as late as uh, early September, just depending on situations. A lot of it's weather dependent. If you get a really strong honey flow going on in May and June, and they're just building comb like crazy, they'll run out of room quick and decide they gotta get take off and split. So just have to keep a good eye on them. So we kind of talked about a little of this. It can be caused from the queen itself. Maybe she's failing. Uh, maybe the colony size is getting too, too crowded. Congestion in the brood nest. The queen doesn't have enough space to lay any more eggs. Um, the, that means the honey's coming in so quick, they're filling all the cells up and the queen just doesn't have anywhere to lay. Could be maybe a large portion of the bees are young and they just, they don't, have enough room for everybody and, and they don't have the patience they want to get going. And like I said, it's mother's nature's way of mite protecting. So some of the signs to look for, um, maybe we had a mild winter, so they didn't use up a lot of their preserves. So going into spring, they're, they're already full of honey. So it don't take much to get crowded. Maybe we have an early spring. So they have a lot more weeks to get that um, hive build up before we have the strong honey flow. Maybe your queen's old and the, the bees realize that and they want to produce a new one because they know they have to have a strong queen to, to be survived the, the year and keep their colony going. Um, drone rearing is early, meaning they're producing more males and they're, they're getting that in their mind. Large number of cups. When you start seeing these swarm cups at the bottom, this is basically if you tip your hive on its side, you'd be looking at the bottom right here. So these are the bottom of the frames. Your swarm cells, we talked about how they look like peanut shells. You can see this one's been opened already. So there's already been a new queen come out of there. Um, I can't tell if this one's quite been opened yet or not, but typically when they do this, they may have two, three, four queens up to even six or eight because um, they don't know which ones are gonna survive or which one's gonna be the best. But typically as soon as that first one hatches, um, they start what they call piping and they make this noise and they're checking to see if there's any other queens in that hive. And when she makes that noise, all that's the only time all the other bees freeze. And she's, she's making that noise to see if there's any other queens in there. And they'll either fight to the death or one of them, the old queen will leave. Um, typically, the old queen's probably already left. And it's just going to be a fight to see who survives out of the new queens. Or maybe there'll be a second swarm and one of the new queens will take off with even some more bees which means you're gonna be left with even fewer numbers in your colony. Um, so keep that in mind, because later on I'm gonna talk about another situation where you can create your own queens um, to, to expand your hives in numbers if you wanna do splits, but you gotta be careful doing that because you can create too many queens and they start actually causing swarming. So just kind of keep that in mind when we talk about that later. So basically here, if you're wanting to look for swarm cells, the easiest way to do it is to pick up the box just like this. So if you look at this picture right here, basically this is a blown up version of that. You can see these frames are on their side. That's the quickest way to find this queen cells right there um, is looking at the bottom of them. Here's some blown up views of them. This is one that's already been opened up, probably another worker going in here to clean it out, maybe chew it off to get back to the original cell. Here's one that still has a queen, a new queen inside there. Um, some people will try to pinch these off. Uh, a lot of times it's too late. Once they've decided that they're making these cells, you're, they're going to pinch these off and it's going to be too late. There might be more of them where they've already got in their mind they're going to leave. Another thing you can do is actually cut this off, take a big area of this, put it in a nuke box with some new frames. And when she hatches out and put some bees in there with her, you can start a new colony that way. That's where I was talking about. You only want to do that with one or two because you can actually create too many queens. And then when you create that new nuke, half of your bees are going to be gone because they left with the other queen. 
Here's some more pictures. Um, usually when they're up on the, further up on the comb like this is what they call a supersedure cell. That case is usually when the queen itself is failing, they may not necessarily leave and swarm. Um, they may just kick the old queen out because she's gonna die soon and then this new queen will take over. So you can also have uh, supersedure cells where that new queen is gonna supersede the old queen and they know that she's failing and not doing good. She, maybe she's not producing enough eggs, but for whatever reason, the other bees will actually just carry her out and get rid of her or kill her. So another thing to look at is you open your hive up and you see this. There is multiple eggs in these cells. You should just see one egg in these cells and I'm seeing well, there's two there at least, two here. Looks like three or four right there in that cell. Those are when you have a, another worker, a female worker that's laying eggs and these bees are gonna be um, not fertile or not, uh, I'm sorry, one back. They won't be fertile, so they're end up gonna be uh, drone cells is what they're gonna be. They're gonna be end up hatching as drones. So what to do if you see that? That slide's not working. But what that tells you to do is you're going to have to go get a queen um, and replace that queen that's gone. This is a really hard situation to take care of because you have a, a female bee in there that's not a queen. She's just a worker. But she thinks she needs to take over and start laying eggs. So it's really hard to change her mind. Since she has no semen, that those leg eggs will not be fertile. So what she's going to do uh, is just keep laying. So what you have to do is somehow try to get rid of that worker bee. Now, when you've got several thousand bees in there, you have no clue which one she is. So one of the methods that you'll hear is you take all your frames and you go 50, 60 yards away from your hive and you shake all the bees off. Every last bee you shake off into the grass and you come back and put all your frames back in the hive, make sure every bee is off that, out of that hive. And the idea is that worker bee that's laying those eggs is gonna be heavy enough that she won't be able to fly back to the, the hive. Um, it's kind of mixed results from what I've been hearing people having with that. Um, it's really hard to get that queen, uh, that worker to change her mind so she doesn't think she's a queen. But that's the situation you have. Uh, I wish there was an easier fix for that, but sometimes, sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. But either way, at some point you may need to get a new queen. So where to get the queen? Um, about any place that sells bees will sell queens. The problem with that is you have no idea where that queen was raised from, what stock it's from. Um, be very cautious of this. What I really like about where we are located is um, we have people that raise their own queens from their own stock not too far from us. Um, I mentioned before that, you know, Jason Foley up at Indianola, he raises bees and produces his own queens. Ellen Bell, um, what I like about her stock is it's not necessarily an Italian or Carnolian, but it's bees from her stock that they've survived the Iowa winters. Um, they've been good producers and she takes it from her own stock and produces queens from them. So um, something like that is works really well. Uh, and I'm going to have a, another way here. Let me see what I got for my next slide. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and talk about that right now. Be a good time. One method I've been using that works really well is I will take my best producing hive that is gentle. Um, that I really like the population, how much they build up and how much honey they produce. I'll pick my best colony and I will go over and I will pull about two frames of brood out that has cat brood, has some young larvae and also has fresh eggs. And I will make sure that there is not a queen on that frame and I will stick it in a nuke. And I'll do about two frames of brood like that that have fresh eggs. And I'll also do about two frames of honey. And then I'll go and shake a bunch of bees off there that I know the queens are not on. 
If the queen's not on that frame, I'll shake all the bees I can off into that nuke box, and then I walk away. And what they do is that, that worker bees decide that they are queenless. And so they will go in there and they will make their own queen. And then it takes about 28 days for them to make that queen for her to hatch and everything to get started again. But I just walk away, come back about a month later and I will check to see at that point if I've got a queen in there. Now maybe she isn't quite laying, but I can see her then I know I've got a fresh colony to start with a new queen. If by chance you happen to take the queen and shake her into that nuke box, it's not the end of the world. That nuke has a queen now, it's gonna be fine. Now your original hive that you took her from, they're the ones that's gonna to have to make the new queen. So either way by doing that, it's also, that's also one way of doing a split. It's a mini split kind of, but you can produce your own queens if you're patient and have the time to do that. Um, if you want to speed things up, there's ways you can do that. One is by doing the on-the-spot queen rearing. There's a whole book on that. Basically what they do is they make a notch. I think we'll talk about that here in another week or so, but um, they actually break the bottom part of the cell off of the, where the egg is at, and that makes the, queen, the worker bees think that it's going to be a queen and they'll build a queen cell around that egg. And it, you have to be careful doing that because like I said earlier, if you notch more than one cell that has an egg in it, they will make queen cells out of however many you notch. And typically you're going to want to notch several of them so that you have a better chance of them producing a queen. But if you don't go back and get rid of some of the weaker ones that don't aren't as big or aren't as plump, um, what you're actually doing is creating more competition and when they take off they're going to take some of your bees with you with them so um but that's kind of a little bit more detailed than maybe you want to get into but for the people that's been doing it a long time um and the guys that's been in the club you know that i'm cheap and i'm always finding ways of doing it myself and doing it easy um, that's one way you can create your own queen so population of your colony, it would be awesome if every one of your hives looked like this, but that's not reality. Um, when you open that box up, one of the first questions you're going to have is, what is my population? Um, you want to create as many bees as you can in your hive without overcrowding them, which is a very, very delicate line to balance. Um, but that's what your goal is, to keep your population up and not overcrowd them. So you're going to be looking for low populations. When you see this, you know you've got something dramatically going wrong. Um, you've got just very few bees there. They're kind of clustering in a small area. You don't see any brood. None of the cells are filled out. You definitely have a problem in this situation. We'll talk more about that here in a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about crowded hives. Um, when you go out there and you see bee bees up here on your hive in the front like this, Depending on the weather, if it's 90 degrees plus out there, this is very common. Um, the bees are going to come out where it's cooler, especially in the evenings. They'll stay out here until after dark, and then they may go back in or they may stay out all night. Depends on how hot it is at night, too. Not uncommon to see this in Iowa when these hot summers, especially in August. But if you go out there in June when we don't have the hot temperatures and your, your hives are crowded like this, and that tells you that you need to probably either split these into two hives or start adding more supers, but you need to give them more room one way or another. Because if you don't, they're going to create their own room by swarming on you and taking off with half the bees. This, I believe, is one of Rose's pictures from her hives. This was actually, I believe, when uh, she pulled the supers off, but I'll let Rose tell more about this. Kind of putting you on the spot here, Rose. Hey, Scott. Yes, this is when I pulled my supers off. This was the first part of August. I had taken three supers off the top of this hive, and this is what ensued. So that tells you that that is a very healthy hive, and they did their job because all of those supers were completely full. Now it's not uncommon when you pull your supers, your bees will cluster on the outside of it. This on the other hand, tells me that that was a super, super strong 
um, colony. Um, I believe Rose did do a, try to do a split on that even late in the year, but she had a heck of a time of getting those bees to go back in those hives after she pulled the supers. In fact, I think she put a super back on to finally appease them. Yes, so, this is a good example. If you look at the hive on the left, you can see the super still on there and that's bearding. So that is normal August time bearding. So that is what that would normally look like. But yes, you are correct. I tried to do a, a walk away split on this. It was, it was one of those where if I didn't do something, they were going to swarm anyways. So it was one of those where you do what you think is right in the moment, whether it is and they stayed for about two days and then decided they didn't like it and they swarmed. So it happens. So this is a picture of when the, the bees are taken off. When they, when they come out of this hive to swarm, they boil out just as fast as they can. I have never actually witnessed this myself. Uh, I did catch a swarm one time, put it in a box, had to leave didn't get it moved and they still had it on their mind to go to the location they had picked out and my wife actually witnessed them he she said they came boiling out of the, the hive they circled about two or three times and she said they all left at one time and she said it was actually kind of cool and kind of sad at the same time to see them leave but she said it was one of the neatest things she got to see but uh when you catch a swarm like that typically you want to move them at least a mile away because that takes them away from all the areas they had found and lets them decide, but maybe the place you provided for them is not so bad. But if you put them in a hive, like say you find it in your yard, you put them in one of your hives you have in your yard, they're probably gonna leave because they, they've already had a place picked out. When they're getting ready to swarm, if you guys ever get to witness it, such as like coming out of a hive, they have a very distinct sound. And Lori's right, they boil out of that hive and they're circling that hive. And in all honesty, it sounds like a, like a freight train. And it's a sound that you've never heard before. And once you hear that sound, you'll recognize it every time. It's a totally unique kind of old time freight trainy sound and just watch them as they're going. And when they land, like Scott said, grab them and move them. Yeah, she actually described it with the, the sound and the circling almost like a tornado. They made that kind of yes. swirling and swirling motion and the, the sound both. And she said it was just, you know, kind of an awe thing to see. Typically, when you think of swarms, you picture these clusters. Um, I guess I started kind of talking about it earlier, how they're not aggressive at this point. The reason they're not aggressive at this point is when they decided to leave, they pretty well know wherever they go, they're not going to have anything there. It's going to be like an unfurnished apartment. There's not going to be any comb. There's not going to be any honey. So what they do is they engorge themselves and they eat as much honey and as much wax as they can to take with them. So when they get there, they have something to start with. So that is why you can, and I've done this. Um, I don't recommend it because I've done it more than once and sometimes it works and sometimes it don't. Um, you can actually stick your hand in most of these swarms and they will not sting you because they're so swollen up with honey they can't sting. The problem is there's a few bees in that bunch that don't get the note that everybody else got and they still decide they want to sting you. So typically on swarms I can go out without a coat on or without my suit on, no veil, and I can put a box underneath these, shake them in the box, fold it up, I'm on my way home. Um, there has been some instances, though, that some of the bees, for some reason, maybe that's why they left. They didn't have the honey reserves, but they were very capable of stinging, and they let me know. So, so here's some just different pictures of swarms, what to look for. Um, I don't think I had ever seen a swarm until I started raising bees, and I think it's because I wasn't looking for them. Um, now that I know what to look for and keep my eyes open, I see some every year. This is actually, um, to set the, set the stage on this, this is at the edge of my yard. There is a line of cedar trees that run down this way. And off to the right is my yard and across about, oh, probably 50 yards of open grass are my hives. 
Now, the reason this is relevant is bees attract bees. Um, they will fly and check out and see what everybody's doing, what they're, where they're getting their honey from, um, see if there's any space available close by. But this line of cedar trees is almost a highway because it's a pattern for them to follow. So I have caught a swarm at least every year since I started living there um, on this tree line somewhere. I have since started using swarm traps and let the swarm traps do it for me, but this is the largest swarm I've ever caught. This was not from my bees. This was from some bees somewhere else that came up to my bee yard. And I'll try to outline the bees go up into here. They come down to the bottom, all the way down here, you can see them. And they go up in here. This is about the size of three basketballs. This is about three times as big as any swarm I usually catch. The, they must have come out of a huge hollow oak tree and just took off. And I can't imagine what, how many was left because that's the biggest swarm I've ever caught. Um, that's probably the first swarm I've ever had to put two deeps on and, and thought about putting a third one on just because there are so many bees in that swarm. Um, swarms come, they may land in trees or they may decide to land on a vehicle. This was actually a semi-trailer right out here at Pilot. I got a call that a uh, semi-driver had parked his trailer there, went home with the tractor, came back on Sunday afternoon and wanted to leave, and this is what he found. So what I did was I climbed up on a ladder. I took a cardboard box. I scooped all those bees with my bee brush into the box, dumped them into the hive, hoping that I had that queen somewhere in that box that she got in there. And I waited and pretty soon all the bees started flying and going right into the entrance of that hive, which told me that queen was in there. Once you have that queen, they will follow her wherever she goes. Left it there for another couple hours. Um, had, by the time I took this box off, I would say 98% of the bees were in that hive. I put a, a cover across the front. You can see I got it strapped, picked it off, took it back to my pickup. While I was suited up, I told the driver to back up. We hooked a semi-trailer up. He took off. I took off my bees, and everybody was happy. So another way of getting bees is cutouts. And cutouts can be from um, trees, the hollow trees that are going to be removed. Maybe they fell down in a windstorm. They could be inside of houses. Um, Anywhere you have bees that you don't want them or need to be removed, that is a cutout. So this is how I got into beekeeping. I always wanted to have some. Um, this was a tree that needed to be removed that a guy had an old farmstead and he was loved taking out all the trees and we knew this high was in there. So I asked him if I could cut the tree down myself and take the bees and he said that'd be fine with him so he didn't have to mess with it. And as you can see, I had absolutely zero equipment. I have a mosquito net for a head veil. That's all I had. I look, this is probably June. Um, I had a long sleeve shirt, leather gloves, duct tape my wrist, duct tape my ankles. I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, I made a homemade BVAC. We'll talk about those a little bit. I cut this out. You can see the comb in the hollow tree here where I cut it. And now I'm just taking this wedge off of the cedar so that I can get down to the bees. Once I got it opened up, um, I got a shot back here. This tube goes into the box. There's another tube coming out here. So what happens is they suck the bees up into the tube. They go in this filter, basically. There's a screen there that traps them. And then the air goes into the, the back. There's a place here to open and shut the air control which allows the bees to be sucked up, but not bounce down the hose. Otherwise, you're going to kill them. So it just barely picks them up and pulls them into that hose. So here they are bearding after I cut into them. And this is kind of a bad picture. I hate to show this because this was, it was, it was an old colony. They've been there a long time. There wasn't a lot of real fresh comb, but I took what comb I could get, rubber banded it around a frame, and stuck it in there so that the bees felt like they had their furniture with them. Um, I tried to get as much brood as I could. I, I don't like this picture because there's no brood, there's no honey, there's no eggs, nothing there. But I was, I'd probably already had that down in these 
frames, but I tried to take as much as I could. So when I got home, I put them in a box that I had. Um, there again, keep in mind, I just had this veil. My wife's about halfway up the yard taking pictures with the camera being on Zoom so she could stay away from them. I had no clue what I was doing, dumped them in the box. And at some point in your bee career, you're going to find out what it's like to have a bee inside of your veil. And this is what happened in my case as I took off running. My wife thought that was hilarious. So that was my first adventure in beekeeping. But the other reason I show this picture is you can see this line of trees. This is a natural runway, like I talked about earlier, that the bees fly. This tree here, this was, picture was taken about 10 years ago and 20 pounds ago. But uh, this tree is about 25, 30 foot tall now. And I can put a bee trap in that tree and every year, I, I, or swarm trap, and I catch a swarm almost every year right there because they're flying this natural fence line. This was a call I got that a guy was remodeling a house that had been vacant for several years here in Osceola. Um, it's kind of a cool picture. This is about 24 inches across. And this is about six to seven foot long. Um, you can see the difference in the old comb versus the fresher, newer, whiter comb. This is downstairs in a basement looking up into the ceiling. And what you can't see is back here, this wall, the outside wall that goes up into the second story, the comb actually went up in that wall too. And I couldn't even get to all of it. So, but I took all this out and the nice thing about it was I had somebody taking pictures to document everything. So this one does a better job of showing here's the bees when I, or here's the, when I started, I'd carry the combs out with hardly any bees. All the bees have been sucked up in the back at this point. I carried out to the guys helping me. They were putting the rubber bands. You can see these actually have honey, capped honey in them. Um, there's capped honey here with a little bit of brood. And they were putting them in the hives for me while I was taking care of the bees inside. This was another cutout I did of a shed. Um, the reason I show this one is when you open this, sometimes you don't really know what's going on. This just looks like nothing but comb up in there. But if you can see, I had to be really careful because what I didn't realize, this is an electrical line that runs up through this wall. So when you're here, this is a serrated bread knife that I used to cut the comb out. You've got to be careful that you don't get into the electrical lines and things like that. So there's a close up view of the electrical line, shows how they build around it. You can see there's a nice fresh new comb here. There's some cat brew or uh, capped honey it looks like right here. I've got some other pictures here that shows this is kind of the waste comb that I threw away. But these are the nice combs that you can see all the brood. You can see some larvae, the white spots of the larvae. There's some capped honey, some more cat brood, some drone cells right down here at the bottom. But when you can take these and put them in squares in the frames, and take that with you and put your bees in that, then the bees feel more content or more apt to stay when you move them. So as far as preventing swarms, uh, we talked about cutting the queen cells. It may help, but it's often too late. You can reverse the two bottom hive bodies, flip them. Um, it kind of confuses them for a little while and takes their mind off of swarming. Um, you can actually take and move the position of the hive. Sometimes that confuses them a little bit too. Um, or what I like doing is making splits, and we'll talk about the splits here in a second. Uh, now we're going to talk about swarm traps. Um, I started doing this about two or three years ago. Um, this is one thing is I really enjoy. I enjoy probably the, the swarm catching, the trap building, and the and trapping of the bees about as much as anything. Um, this is basically the size of a five-frame nuke but it's a lot taller. Your deep frames are only gonna go down about half to two thirds of the way of this box. Because what you're doing is I usually put about three frames in this trap with, uh, with comb on it. And when the bees come in there, when they go in there and walk around, they feel all that open area because there's been research that showed, and if you read some of Tom Seeley's books, He's done research that shows the bees will go in there and when they walk around, it's basically like they're measuring the open space of that box. 
and they've done research to see what size boxes bees prefer. And that's kind of how the Langstroth hive decided on its size. But especially these beach or swarm traps, they have built because that is a size that bees have preferred. They've put different trap sizes up and this is the size they prefer. But without open space in there, in the bottom especially, they feel like they have room to grow and build up their own comb. I can tell you the higher, um, a couple keys to swarm trapping, the higher you can get the swarm trap, the better as far as attracting bees, but it's a lot more awkward to, to get down when it's full of bees too. So um, this type of hole seems to be a lot better than a round hole or a cover. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But make sure you've got it securely fastened because it never fails. You put these up and there's always a windstorm, especially in Iowa in June um, or in late May. But putting those in the right location is, is key. They can be several different types. Um, you can actually buy a commercial cardboard version. I would not recommend this because I really am not sure. It's a lot more work to get the bees out of it. Um, with these are just deep frames. Uh, once the bees go in, you pull the frames out and put them in a regular hive and you're good to go. If you notice, if you're going to use a big hole like this, um, you can actually see the wire in that hole opening. That is to keep birds from going in there um, and building the nests in there. If you're going to have a hole like this, build you some sort of a trap door that once you catch the swarm, you can flip that down and you don't have to worry about the bees flying around you when you go to remove it. Um, the reason I show these two pictures also, these have a nice backboard with a hole in it that you can just put a nail in a tree, hang it up there and pull it off real easily. It's a little bit more uh, work to get these straps undone, take it off. But if you have some sort of way of closing that opening up, um, especially when you go out there in the evening once all the bees are in there, um, it's a lot easier to uh, move the bees and not have to worry about them flying around when you're trying to get that unstrapped. So some of the keys to success of trapping, these are just things I jotted down that I found are important, I think, when you're setting your traps. Location, probably number one. Um, like I said, if you can set that along a natural runway, the edge of a timber, um, along a fence line, even if you can find the corner of two, like where the corner of a forest or a corner of a two fence lines coming together, that's a good location. That seems to be even better than the middle of a bunch of trees because they like to fly those outside edges when they're going to and from their, their hive they're already in. So the location, a lure, I use lemongrass oil. Um, you can buy commercial lures for swarm lures. I just buy uh, lemongrass essential oil. I take a, a unscented paper towel, put about seven or eight drops of lemongrass oil right on top of the frame with the drops of oil on it. And if you can freshen up every week or two, it's even better. But that's what I use as an attractant. And you'll find that that smells like the inside of your hives. Frames with comb will help. Um, it's a good way to use your old comb that you don't really plan on using a lot, but you got to keep in mind is um, you probably are going to end up using this comb for a while because once this you catch a swarm, you're going to remove that frame into your hive for a while. So um, I just use comb. It's usually uh, left over from last year after I did my supers or whatever. Um, of course, my supers are deep, so I can use those frames. But the comb seems to help attract them too. I would check it weekly. My rule is to check them once a week at minimum. Once I have caught a swarm, I like to leave it there for anywhere from five to seven days just for them to get established. They'll start building comb. If you build it or if you leave it longer than that, you're going to have a mess inside where that open space is. They're going to build bird comb like crazy. But as soon as you see it in a swarm in there, um, especially if you've just been by there two or three days ago and nothing was flying in and out of it, Leave it there for two or three days once they're in there to just to kind of get secured and, and feel confident and then for them to establish that as their house. Um, make it easy to remove. The higher, the better, like I said, but it's more difficult to deal with. Make sure it's easy to close up, um, to move it. Place it 
near highs or where you know there's bee activity, I always say everybody should have at least a bee tra a swarm trap anywhere they have hives because your bees may swarm on you without you knowing it and it'd be really nice for you and convenient to already have a trap in place for them to have a choice to go to. Doesn't mean they're going to take it, but it's just one more possibility of rather than losing half your bees, now you just let them create a, a split for you. And this is kind of my little secret. Um, if you put all those things together, that's also pretty much the same place you put a deer stand. So any of you guys that deer hunt and have deer stands, you are not using those stands in June, May or in June. So what a great opportunity you'd have right there to set a, set a swarm trap up on your deer stand. It's probably gonna be anywhere from eight to 12 feet up off the ground, which is what you want. Um, so that's what your stands probably are, maybe taller. It's probably gonna be on the edge of a timber and you've got everything you need, a nice ladder already there. So I have had really good luck with setting my swarm traps on deer stands. Um, and if you don't have deer stands, I'm sure you, you know somebody that deer hunts, they're not gonna have any problem with you putting swarm traps up there provided you get them out prior to deer season. So um, that's the last thing they wanna mess with when they're going up to their stand is a, a hive of honeybees. So you get your swarm trap filled up, you can take them back, you can put them in nuke boxes. Um, if it's not a big swarm, that way they don't have a big area. If it's a big swarm, you can put it in a full 10 frame box. Um, like I said, you can also do your own splits where you just pull out a couple of frames of brood from your existing colony, stick it in a nuke, and away you go. Um, leave it alone for about four weeks, come back and check to see if you got a queen or not. Um, letting them make their own, it takes a little bit longer, but it's a quick, easy way of creating another colony. A couple of years ago, I started out with four colonies going into spring. I did splits, I caught swarms. By the end of the season, I think I had 15, swar or 15 hives. Um, so never spent a dime on any queen, any boxes or anything. If you're not in a hurry to buy bees, um, you get your equipment, um, if you can find some comb or lemongrass oil, you know, and are patient and, and don't wanna just rush everything, you can catch your bees probably in the first year. Um, or talk to people. I'm always finding people that have existing bees that know their colonies are too big. They've got up to four or five colonies, whatever they may have, and say, hey, I don't want any more. I don't want any more work. I just have the ones I have. I don't want to get any bigger. Last year, I, I had one person that I ended up getting four colonies off of because they wanted to split every colony they had, and they needed to be split. They had so many bees in each colony. Um, when you stop and think about a three pound package is about $150, um, there's a lot of easier ways, to, cheaper ways to get bees, whether you trap them, get somebody else to split, um, it's, it's, can be done pretty reasonably. So ways to make splits, um, we're going to talk basically, they, they call uh, what they call a walk away split. Um, I've done this before, had good success with it. When I open my boxes up in the spring and I've got a good uh, colony and you see brood, um, here's, you know, we talked a lot about, we're going to look at a lot of frames tonight. And at the end, we're going to look at several of them. You're going to tell me what you see in them. But this frame here, this big oval shape is all brood. Every one of those cells is almost capped off. There's been a few empty that's probably already hatched. There's some honey, capped honey at the top here, but I can tell you by looking at this, it's probably anywhere from uh, late May to early July, maybe late June, but that's the time of year when they're gonna be in full brood production. Um, when you've got two deeps that have a lot of bees, a lot of brood, you can actually separate those two deeps onto two different bottom boards and put a new, put two inner, you know, an inner cover on each one, an outer cover on one. You've taken one colony and created two. Now, you probably want to separate that second one that you took off the top by quite a ways away. If you can, take it to a new, whole new bee yard. Um, one of those hives has the old queen in it. 
if you're not comfortable with finding the queen, not a problem. Whichever box does not have the queen, they're going to realize that they're queenless and they're going to take some of those fresh eggs and make their new queen. So what you need to do when you split that box is make sure both boxes have at least one frame of fresh eggs or lar young larvae on those frames. If you have that, um, then you'll be able to take two boxes or one box and make two. That's what they call a walk away split because you walked away not knowing where that queen was at, but you really don't quite care. Now, if you're good at finding the queen and you want to speed the process up, you can leave the queen in the one box, take the other box away, buy another queen and put in that box, and now they're going to be full production right off the bat. So that is one way of doing a walk away split. Um, or I've also taken um, one deep like this full of bees, and you could take probably three nuke boxes and pull brood off of these and make four colonies out of one box if you wanted. Now it's gonna take a longer time for them to split up, but you have to decide what your goal in production is. Are you wanting to build your numbers up? Or are you wanting to get honey production? Last year I increased my, like I talked about from four to 15, and I still put up about 30 gallons of honey. So it didn't hurt me too bad in honey production. I could have had a lot more provided they was all full at the beginning of the year, but um, they will build up fast if you have a good honey flow. So here's where I was talking about, they've taken a box and they put a couple frames of brood in each of the nuke boxes. Uh, and then they're gonna come back and fill these up with either empty frames or they might have frames with honey in them. Um, but these are nuke boxes that hold five frames. Now they don't have to put all five frames in there, um, but you, you, they're gonna fill up with brood if you don't do something event, or fill it up with burcomb if you don't eventually put frames in there. So basically what bees need for good healthy colonies is good nutrition, um, feed them if they're necessary. I think in my opinion, people feed too much in some instances and others don't feed enough. But if generally if the bees aren't going, they're not gonna use your sugar water if there's dandelions and stuff out there to eat uh, or to get new, the nectar and pollen off of. They prefer the, the natural stuff far over the, what we produce for them. Uh, the young fertile queen, check to see if there's a presence of queen. Um, make sure there's no damaging level of the diseases and parasites. Don't worry about the diseases and parasites for right now. That is going to be the last week. Uh, we will go into detail of everything you need to know about disease and parasites. So now we're changing from midsummer um, going into late summer. What happens are these bees are going to start producing less brood and start producing more honey because they know the season's changing and they need to start making honey to survive the winter. So now you're going to see these more white caps instead of the brown caps like we saw earlier that had brood in them. This is going to be capped honey. They will not cap that honey until the moisture content is where it will keep at forever. Once they cap it, that honey will last forever. Um, you'll be adding supers, um, always staying ahead of them. Um, don't let them overcrowd. Make sure they always have room for extra honey. You typically aren't gonna see this many boxes, especially around here. Um, you know, two or three supers like this is not uncommon, but you're not gonna see stacks probably over your head. You're going to, this will be the time when you put your supers on, you're going to be adding your queen excluders. This is all probably going to happen, adding boxes and queen excluders. Um, it may happen in April. In fact, when I go out and do my rotation of my boxes in my spring, if my colonies are strong, I'll rotate my two deep boxes and I'll add um, a deep super on right when the dandelions start blooming. That way I'm ahead of them. They know they got plenty of space. And I know I've got plenty of time. It's going to take them a long time to fill up that deep. So that's all going to take place uh, pretty early. But all summer long, you're going to be keep adding supers and checking them. You're going to use a 7-10 rule. So every time that they have at least seven frames filled up out of the 10, you're going to add another box. And you're going to keep doing that until probably until about mid-July. 
And then at that point, you're just gonna let them fill everything up. So here's a good picture up close. Um, this is honey that's probably not the moisture level it's gonna keep yet. So it hasn't been capped. And this is a nice white caps of the capped honey. Burr comb, basically like we said earlier, burr comb is any comb that you do not want um, in any situation. It may, it may be like this, this comb is not something you want. So this, we could just call it burr comb. You'll scrape that off and make them start over. Um, if you had an empty spot in your hive for some reason, maybe you pulled the feeder out and forgot to put a frame in, uh, that empty space, they're gonna fill it up with comb and we call it burr comb because it's not where we want it. Um, some bees have a tendency, and this one almost looks like they started it, Instead of building the comb this way with the frame, they'll build a section here, section here, section here, kind of like they did, but it'll come out at a 90 degree angle like this. Um, we're not sure exactly why they do that, but the simple cure for that is to turn your entire hive 90 degrees. If you've got a colony that just will not follow the rules with the frame and they build all their comb perpendicular to them, turn your Turn your hive 90 degrees, and that usually solves the problem. Here's some burr comb that is just on top of the, the frames. You'll scrape that off every time you do an inspection. And this is what happens when you have an empty box and you don't put frames in there. They will fill up every voided spot, and that comb, um, there's not much you can do with it. You can't hardly extract it. You can use it for... Uh, um, just comb honey, eat it like it is. It's really hard to get the honey out of it if you want to do liquid honey. Um, comb honey, if you're going to do that, you got to start putting your frames in. Um, there's a high demand for that these days. We'll talk about comb honey next week and how to produce that. Next week, we're going to be talking about all the different things you can get out of your hive, whether it's honey, comb honey, pollen, nectar, or uh, wax, any of the products you can produce out of your hive. So the one thing I, I wanted to want you guys to understand is you can look at a frame and pretty well tell the time of the year and tell if your bees are doing what they need to be doing at that time of the year. So in the spring, you're going to see a little bit of this honey here is capped honey that's went through the winter. It's darkened over age, and you're going to have a small little football shaped cluster of brood that the queen's just kind of starting to, to produce. Um, she's not really gotten full production yet. So this is probably what your, your hives are gonna look like here in about two months, um, come early spring. Then what's gonna happen is she's gonna start producing a bigger football shape, big oval shape, and you're gonna have a little bit of honey on the corners, but not much. This is gonna be up until about mid-June they're going to decide that they, they're in full brood production. What they want is to build a colony, build their numbers, get as many workers as they can. And then the next thing you're going to see is starting in about probably July, your brood production is going to start going down, and they're going to start filling the corners up with honey and start moving closer in. As the brood production goes down, they start filling up with honey because they start realizing you know, we've, we've had that uh, summer solstice there about uh, July or June 21st or so. The hours are starting to get shorter. Daylight hours are getting shorter. They know they have to start filling full of honey. Now you're starting to see less and less brood, more and more honey. And this is what they're going to do with those two deeps is they are going to have to cut their numbers down in production. As far as egg laying, they already have the numbers they need that are adults. So they want to start laying or start producing honey and start stop producing the number of bees they're going to need because they don't want to feed anybody more than they have to in the winter. And then by fall, pretty much your supers um, are going to be all topped off, capped off, but your deep, deep frames are going to look about like this too. So you want to make sure that they have produced as much honey as they possibly can in those bottom two deep boxes so they have as much food as they possibly can um, 
produce for themselves. So now what to look for during your inspections. Number one, you're gonna look at the population. Is your hive healthy? Do you have a strong population or are there just not very many bees in there? And this is where we tell people it's nice if you have two hives, um, even if you're first getting started, that way there's something to compare, compare to. If you open up your bees in, oh, well, say late May, and you just don't see a lot of bees there and you say, well, it's still early in the year. If you had another hive to compare that to, you might realize that, hey, this other hive is really strong. Something's going on with this other one. Uh, maybe you need to add, maybe they are a, a strong population and you need to add supers. Uh, the brood size, is your queen producing? Is the brood pattern good? Do you see eggs? Um, if you see eggs, I don't worry about looking for the queen. I have so many people worried about, oh, I can't find my queen. I can't find my queen. Um, if you can't find your queen, as long as you find eggs, you know that she's been there in the last 24 hours. The chances of her, something happening to her in the last 24 hours are pretty slim. So don't worry about it. Um, a lot of times I'll open the hive, look and see how, what the population is, keeping in mind that you're probably gonna open your hive sometime in the afternoon when half the bees are gone in a way. If you still have a good population um, and you see eggs, I close it back up and I'm done in a couple minutes, no big deal. Um, are they bringing honey in? Are they producing honey like you want them to? Do you see any disease or any bugs or pests or webworms or anything like that in there? Um, so these are kind of some of the slides that I want you guys to look at and maybe on the chat box or unmute for a second and tell me what you see. I've got about four or five slides here before we end the night and just tell me what, if you guys open that up, would you be happy with this? And what do you see? Maybe tell me what time of year it is. Okay, see the cat brood, probably summertime, a little bit of burr comb. Yep. Yeah, this is a frame that you'd be happy with. I mean, shoot, I wish every one of my queens produced brood like that. Almost every single cell is full, which is that when people talk about a brood pattern, that's what you want is a, is a pattern that has hardly, you know, she didn't lay an egg here and an egg here and an egg here. She completely filled every cell she had a chance of. You see a few open spots here. They probably have already hatched and came out. Um, there's a little bit of bur burr comb down here. This, even though it looks a little bit like a um, queen cell, it's not, that's just burr comb. Um, but that's, you know, good, probably mid June, um, early June, even depending on when the honey flow was. That's a really good frame of bees right there. If you have that, you look in there, maybe the next frame's got fresh eggs on it. Boom, there's no reason to go any further. You, you've seen everything you need to see. Everything looks good. I'd be happy with that. All right, this one's a little bit different story. Tell me what you see on this one. or maybe what you don't see on this one. Okay, somebody said swarmed, could be. I, I don't think that's a situation on this and I'll tell you why here in a little bit. Very little capped honey. Yeah, I don't see, I, I don't see hardly any capped honey on this. Um, frame without honey, starving bees. Yeah, that's kind of what I see. I don't see any brood. I don't see, uh, I don't see any capped honey. Um, I don't see a queen. It's kind of hard to tell in this picture, but I, I, first thing I kind of wonder, you see the butts of these bees sticking out. Are those dead bees that died in the cells? Um, these bees are starving out. There's no question there. I would suspicion there's probably not a queen at all in here. Um, there's no fresh brood, no eggs. This is a hive that if I open that up and I saw that and there wasn't much else 
um, in that hive, I would be very concerned. This, this is probably a hive that's um, it's possible that, that it was starting to run out of food and they swarmed or absconded and left. Um, but when you see this, you, you know right away there's something dramatically wrong and you need to do some more research. Just with one frame here, it's hard to say exactly what's going on, but um, when you start not seeing things that should be there, those are clues that something's going on. Hey, Scott, it almost makes me wonder if this is a robbing situation to where the hive collapsed and another hive has come in and is robbing. Because you can see everywhere else around here, it's pretty well picked clean. Yeah, I agree. I, I would probably say we haven't really got into mites yet. That's the last week. But this was probably a colony that was not treated for mites. They were weak to begin with. Um, they were going into winter. Um, if you look at the grass in the background, this is obviously not during the green season. Um, I'm guessing this is either really late fall or early spring. Um, they might have made it through winter. And this is probably, you know, could be one of the times I was talking about that they've used up all the reserves. They're not healthy. They don't have any food to go get. Um, might be one of the situations where maybe the queen's there and that you just need to supplement them and get them built back up. Um, one of the things I do in situations like this is where I have a lot of different bees in each of my, or a lot of different hives in each of my um, bee yards is if I see this and let's say, hey, I found the queen, she's still there in that, in that box somewhere. I'll go over and grab a couple frames of brood from my other uh, colonies, maybe one from, you know, each one stick in there. And in a couple of days, they're going to have, you know, several hundred bees hatching to help go get food and maybe put some frames of honey in there with them too, just to give them a kickstart to get going. Um, but I want to do, I'd want to do some more research and look more into the hive to see exactly what's going on. But there's several situations here that just set up red flags that tells you, you need to look at that situation a little further. All right, you pull this frame out. What do you guys see? That is a hot mess. That, that is. Let's see what people say here. Lane worker, yep, no bees. What you really want to look for is what Dan said is you have a laying worker. And how he knows that is you have two eggs in each cell here. Um, this case, you might have one, which is what it should be. But there, see how it's not in the center of the cell? Um, typically, the queen will have the egg in the center of a cell. If they're off to the side or if there's two in a cell, that means you have a laying worker. And that, at that point, you have to look at what your population is as a whole. Is it even worth sacrificing the bees that you have left? Chances are, if there's no queen in there, um, you don't have a strong population in a way. If there's not very many bees, you may just want to scrap it and start over. Um, if you do still have a good number of bees in there, which you may, um, maybe at that point you want to start dumping them out or put them with another hive that has a queen in there. Typically, um, if you put them in another hive, you can do it in a manner that the pheromones of that other queen is strong enough that the laying worker will stop. But the, still, the best thing is to go out in the yard, dump all the bees out in the yard and make them fly back, regardless of how you do it. Um, but that that's a mess there. Um, that's just a bad situation. I've been in that situation before, and it's it's usually not a good outcome unless you combine them with something else. All right, what do you see on this one? And feel free to unmute, guys, and, and uh, speak up, too, because I've looked at these slides plenty of times. I know what's going on with them. Looks like they're starting to swarm. Yeah. Yep, queen cells. That's, you know, when you first look at this, um, Yep, everybody's on the right track. Hive may prepare a swarm. 
when you first look at this frame, you think, oh, right, I got a good queen. She's laying good brood pattern. I got a lot of brood going on there. I'm happy with it. Um, but if you don't flip that box up or look at the bottom of those cells and notice these, these queen cells here at the bottom, um, then you know you're going to have a problem pretty quick. So why don't you guys tell me some situations that you could do, and I'll tell you what I would do in this situation. Not everybody at once now. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's Mark, I'd probably exactly what you just said. I would probably personally, if I had the situation, first of all, you know, the bees are probably crowded. Um, when you see a brood pattern like that, and a lot of bees and, and you look down here at the bottom where your hive is, almost every one of these is full of bees. Um, they're probably crowded. You're, regardless, you're going to want to add a super to it or the next deep, whatever, depending on what the next box is. I personally would say, hey, here's my chance to make a bunch of splits. I would pull that, that frame out right there, stick it in a nuke. Um, depending on the time of year, maybe you got um, a box with some frames of honey in it, or maybe there's a good honey flow going, or a honey flow going on with the flowers and stuff. Put a couple of these frames in a nuke box. That's going to divide these numbers down and create and put in some new empty frames with no, no, uh, maybe not even have comb on it. That's going to keep those bees busy and occupied and take the swarming off their mind. Um, but you can make, here's your chance to make two or three nuke boxes and starts. And, you know, I know some people out there going, well, I don't need, need any more bees. They're selling nukes for $175, people. There's a chance to make some income and pay for some of the um, hive, hive equipment costs and everything. So um, very seldom do I ever have problems getting rid of bees. Um, there's always seems like there are people looking. Now, later in the season, it's hard to get rid of them. But uh, when you see this early, early season, you still have a good chance of getting rid of those bees. Um, so, yeah, that's why I always try to keep some nukes on hand is, Right there is a good chance to do a split. And by doing that, you're taking the numbers down in the original hive and putting some fresh frames in there and keeping those bees occupied. So good answers. All right, here's one another picture of a frame. What do you see on this one? It's kind of a blurry picture, I apologize, but it's the only one I could find that had the, what I was looking for. Hi, Scott. Hi. Four brood patterns. Yep. So the brood pattern, um, you don't see the nice oval football shape that you should have. It's real spotty. She laid here, laid here, missed all these, laid here. So you probably have a queen that's failing. For some reason, she's just not doing good. Um, in this situation, you know, it looks like your population's low. Um, I'd want to look at some more frames, but I would probably want to find that queen and put her out of her misery and replace her with a new one. Um, if you had two hives side by side, one looked like this and one looked like the last frame we had, well, there's your chance to take that queen cell and put in this colony and strengthen both colonies and fix two problems with one, with one solution. Um, you've always kind of got to be thinking when you open these hives up, what you can do. Um, that's where by keeping bees, you got to be ahead of them and help them out sometimes. Um, they, will, they will keep trying as hard as they can to go on like this. And at some point, they need to get rid of that queen, and sometimes you need to help them do that. Eventually, they'll probably do it in a way, but Okay, we're just about the end here. We're, we made it to the fall season, and this is what you need to do during the fall. First of all, I like to tell people, um, I think Rose usually uses uh, the state fair time. 
I like to say about the 1st of August. Um, but you need to be thinking about pulling your supers off for the honey you're going to harvest and decide what you're going to do and what you need to do for the fall. But if you take your supers off within the first couple of weeks of August, that gives you time to get plenty of treatments done for varroa mites. And the reason you want to start so early is it may take you two to four weeks to get your treatments done. So by September 1st, whatever eggs are produced at that point after your treatments are going to be the eggs probably that get you through the winter. And if you wait to pull your supers off September 1st, and then comes October 1st by the time your treatments are done, um, you could be too late in the season for having healthy bees going into winter. So at, usually around the 1st of August is the time to be thinking about that. And we're going to talk more about the Roa treatment and everything in the last week. But so you pulled your supers off. You're going to treat for Varroa. Um, you're probably going to do some Varroa mite checks. We'll talk about that again later too. Last week, get your treatments done. Uh, may or may not need antibiotics. I don't think out of all the years I've done this, I've used any antibiotics. I just haven't had to. Um, I have a bottle of it. Just never used it. Didn't need it. But that's the time to do it. You don't want to treat for varroa or treat antibiotics anytime when you have supers on. That's why we'll, we'll be treating, I'll probably treat my hives with uh, an auxilic acid um, here before I put my supers on this spring and then they'll hit, get hit again after I pull the supers off in the fall. So when you have your supers on, you cannot treat for varroa and you cannot treat with uh, antibiotics. So. Uh, we'll talk more about that last week, but this is your time now that Super's off to do those treatments. You want to make sure that your hives got plenty of honey to build up for the winter. So by you pulling your Super's off the 1st of August, it also makes all those bees go down to those two deeps. And they, at that point, they congregate down there. It gives them a chance to say, hey, there's a little bit open space here, a little bit open space there. They're going to fill up every little crack and crevice they can with honey. Um, you want to get those hives up to 110, 120 pounds so they have plenty of food going through winter. This is when you'll also reduce your hive entrances, um, give them less space, uh, maybe put on some moss guards. Uh, you want to get that done before the mice start moving in the fall because when those bees move up in that upper part of the hive, there's no better place for, bee for mice to want to live than down there in the bottom of that box, and they can create quite a mess. If you're going to wrap your hives, if you're going to put mouse guards on, any of that stuff needs to be, you be thinking about when you're going to do that, probably in November. Um, the nice thing about raising bees or keeping bees is you kind of get the winter break. Um, it's about six to eight months out of the year you're going to be working with the bees, and then you get that time off in the winter time. So it gives you time to kind of calculate to see how you did, what you want to do different next year, if you want to start ordering some more product, more hives to build for the spring, but you kind of get a break off. But if you do get those 50 degree days, which like we probably will here another week or two, um, that is a time to check your food supplies to see how they're doing. Um, I don't, do not recommend opening your hives unless you have at least 50 degrees. Um, It says, I had a question here, do you leave mouse guards on all winter in place of a small opening? What I do um, personally is I don't use entrance reducers on my big hives that are healthy. I put a mouse guard on because I have had several instances where mice get in there in the winter time. So all my hives right now do not have uh, entrance reducers, but they do have mouse guards. But with a mouse guard on, you have to be a little bit more concerned about ice buildup and snow buildup. In fact, I went out today and wiped, around, wiped all the snow off some of my hives because uh, with those mouse guards on, the holes fill up pretty quick. Um, I, I wanted to make sure that even though if everything's set up correctly, the bees can get out of the boxes if they want. In fact, today they was actually peeking out a little bit at the top. Because um, some of them, they've been in there so long, they need to come out and basically have a bathroom break. And that's what they were doing. Um, but 
the problem is if your entrance reducer gets plugged up with snow, you're not getting that airflow up through there to get rid of that moisture inside the hive. Um, they're going to build up their cluster temperature enough that it's going to create some condensation. Moisture is going to collect on those um, inner covers, hopefully go up through the inner cover and the outer cover, collect on the outer cover, drip back down on the inner cover, and eventually evaporate. Um, if you don't have that entrance open where they can get that moisture or the airflow up through there, um, then that's a problem. So that's why it's important to keep those open. But um, I'll probably be here in a couple of weeks when we get that 50 degrees go through. And that's going to be a crucial time that end of February, early March period to see exactly what the food supply is, what the population of my bees are. Um, I have some boxes that I put quilt boards on that had um, sugar patties in there to help kind of get them through the winter. They was a little bit low on honey reserves. Um, but I have several big hives that do not ha don't have any sugar patties or pollen patties or anything in there. So I want to make sure that their food supply that they had is adequate enough to get them by the next two or three weeks. Um, so I know for how much supplementing I need to do. So that's kind of, I would say between now and the dandelion season is going to be the most crucial time for your bee survival. Um, typically, if you lose them, that's when you're going to lose them. And I see a lot of people that'll check them here in the next week or two, say, oh, we're good. And then and about a month later, they come back and say, well, my bees are all dead. Well, they didn't have enough food supply. So I think with that, we're getting close here to the end. I have another question, it looks like. It says, a farmer wants me to put bees on the farm. The person bought a bunch of hives at an auction that were used not the best of shape. They stored in a loosely contained shed. I'm afraid to use them. Yeah, I would, uh, a couple things you can do. The question is about using uh, used equipment. Um, a couple things you can do there. If there's any comb, I strongly would either scrape it off and start over or have it inspected. Um, if you're with the boxes themselves, what I typically do is scrape them down with a putty knife, uh, power wash them down, um, spray them down with bleach if you want, um, but then repaint them. And if they're, if they're usable, repaint them, and then that usually seals everything up enough that you can use them again. Um, there's actually some people that are now boiling them or freezing them. If you got a place, to, um, like right now, they be cold now outside, they're froze. But scraping all that stuff down and getting a clean box and painting it makes a big difference. But I've used used equipment like that before, uh, refurbished the boxes. I mean, even my own equipment a lot of times needs to be replaced after so many years. And I do a lot of repainting this time of year. So hope that answers your question. Uh, see what's The other thing uh, I see a lot of this time of year is people pulled their supers off last year. They still have comb in there, obviously, but the honey's gone. Um, be checking on that because I've had a lot of people that had um, hive beetles get in there or web uh, moth. Um, web, I call them web worms, but they're actually uh, moths. Wax moths. Wax moths, yeah, thank you, Riz. Wax moths will get in there and they will absolutely destroy the comb. And we'll have pictures of that the last week of class when we talk about the, the pests and everything. But um, the question is, will repainting and cleaning remove the risk of foul brood? If you're concerned with foul brood, I would say probably painting alone would not be enough. Um, I would say that's where the bleach is probably gonna have to come in, but we'll talk about foul brood here in two weeks so I can answer that question better. Question is, uh, if you have an elevated deck on your house, try placing a storm on the trap of the railing. Yes, um, there again, it's like the deer stand. It's up, it's above what they normally, ground level is scary to bees. I think because of generations of bears and everything else knocking hives over and getting into them, they like to go high. So deck railings, I've had people in town put swarm traps on their deck railings and catch swarms in town. Um, so that's a good place if you don't mind um, you know, obviously you have little kids around or something, you probably don't want to have a swarm trap right there. But uh, yeah, 
any place that's high and easy accessible decks, deer stands, whatever, are good places for swarm traps. But as far as your foul brood question, um, I'll do some more research on that between now and when we do our foul brood session in week six. I'm thinking that you could probably spray that with uh, bleach water, but I'll, I'll check on that and find out.